Hello, hello, and thanks for joining me for the last video of 2020, unless I get really bored over the next few days, but probably the last video of 2020. And it's been a long year, but we finally made it. So I don't have a lot to share today. Uh, we're not going to dive into many, many things. We'll do a little bit of a recap of some of the big things that have been happening in the flurry that was the last couple of months. One or two uh, small bits of news, and then kind of just a tee up for what we're going to start next year with, and then a Say Merry Christmas, Happy Holidays, and I'll leave you with that. If this is your first video joining us, again, don't know why it would be, but sure, don't forget to hit that subscribe button. Uh, and otherwise, let's have a look at some of those kind of news points uh, that I want to take a look at. So, first things first, one of the last videos I did was the Databricks Runtime 7.5 review that was out in beta. That is now GA. So if you're thinking through some of those features, if you remember we had the ability to merge into structs and have kind of um, name-based updates on there, which has got so many applications for managing changing data. That's now live. So you can go ahead and use Databricks Runtime 7.5 in production, in Ango, and see how it works. I've not yet done any deep, low-level testing on it. So, you know, but if Databricks have put it live, I assume they have. So yes, take a look at that. Let me know what features you check out. Let me know what you think of it. Um, and especially if you come up with any new and weird, wonderful patterns for doing evolving schema evolution um, using those new libraries, it'd be great to hear down in the comments below. So other bits and pieces, I did spot one thing out on the Databricks blogs this morning, uh, which is all to do with natively querying Delta. So actually completely outside of the Spark ecosystem. And that has been a little bit of a downside with Delta. Delta is entirely open source. Uh, and Delta has a load of methods uh, and kind of um, ways of exposing Delta to other ecosystems, but not everyone's built it in yet. You know, you have to kind of build a thing that can read through the transaction log, that can understand that and go and query the bug and do all of that stuff. And it's not necessarily being done in lots of places. Um, and this program is being able to kind of essentially, there's a Delta standalone reader. So a bunch of libraries to make it even easier for you to integrate with your language of choice to go and read Delta. So there's a few things they're talking about. So the main thing is there is this library. You can go and get all the code for it. You can build it with SBT because it is Java based. So it's JVM library. Uh, but you can pull that down, build it locally, and then use it for a lot of different stuff. So I'll pop the link for that in. You can go and have a dig. Um, there's a few things to so kind of uh, how you do it if you're writing Java, you've got examples for reading Delta, writing to Delta. Uh, the Rust API um, is again kind of another exposed API to then take, I guess it's kind of like it's using some of this stuff. It's using that library uh, via Rust to be able to go and speak to a load of stuff. So again, useful. For me, useful stuff, there's a Python ad adaptation. So if you are doing Python in a standalone system that is not Spark based, so you're not writing PySpark, you're writing Python, and you want to be able to say, oh, what was the last update to that Delta table? Or how many rows did we put in yesterday? You want to be able to query some of the transaction log metadata. You can do that via these, uh, this bit of code, which is useful. Uh, if you want to be able to read from the Delta table, again, there is a sample uh, bit of code for you to do it. You've got to be a little bit careful because if you're dealing with huge data volumes, and then you try and query it just directly with Python, that may not do so well. In those points, you might want to go through Databricks as it is. Now, I guess a lot of people kind of looking at that going, okay, so, well, I could just query Databricks, right? I could just run a, a SQL query against the JDBC endpoint or the kind of uh, the new SQL analytics endpoints, express whatever query I was doing, select star from my Delta table, and just do it that way. Why do I need this? And it's all about, one, do you have a cluster turned on? So separation of storage of compute is fantastic for being able to scale and flex compute independently of our storage. And if we can't take advantage of that when the cluster's down, then that kind of, it's not as separate as we'd like it to be. Um, so the more we get of this kind of stuff, the more we are able to still interact and work with the data when it's in the lake outside of the Databricks ecosystem using the same common standards, then fantastic. I mean, I've seen so many times when we're handing it over to machine learning, it's not big enough, kind of bulky enough machine learning to bother doing at scale on a Spark environment, or they do now have the single node clusters. Um, but a lot of those cases, you just spin up a Docker container and kind of just run a little model inside a container. And then it couldn't talk to the lake to read the Delta. So we either had to have a cluster in the way, in which case you must write it in cluster, 
or we had to save our data in a different format so that it was accessible, like an interchange layer of CSVs or standard parquet or whatever it happens to be, uh, so that other things can pick it up. And the more we see this kind of thing, the more actually we can say, I mean, our Docker can, can just read that file and then we worry about um, scale, uh, the size of the data we're pulling over and all that kind of uh, stuff. But as long as we're dealing with, you know, we produce aggregate sets, we produce summary files, uh, all that kind of stuff just makes it accessible. Uh, also, for a long time, we've been doing things like storing uh, metadata and configuration data and, you know, kind of processing rules and all of that kind of stuff uh, in a separate system. We tend to store that in a SQL DB, Cosmos DB, some kind of database. Um, because we have systems that are constantly querying it and doing single record lookups and doing kind of um, interaction that are not Spark-based interactions. Um, and it'd be kind of nice in some ways to have that metadata just accessible as a delta table. But we've always avoided it because then obviously we kind of have things like data factory reading on metadata. You'd have to go through Databricks and that's a whole bag of wrong. If we're going this way and we can start doing things like just read the table, and it doesn't matter whether it's going from data factory, it's going from a function, or it's going from Spark, or everything can read that data. It's fantastic. So the work they're doing here to kind of push this forward and make this kind of more accessible, it's just all good news for anyone who's building a, a lake ecosystem that has more than one component in it, more than just Databricks at a lake. If you're going to talk to other things, if you're going to use scheduling, if you're going to integrate with other teams, all of this is just good news in terms of moving in the right direction. So good stuff. And literally that, that is all of the news I've really got. Cause honestly, from my side, I am shutting down for the holidays. It is on my last day of actually doing any consulting work. And yeah, I'm just gonna chill out and play Cyberpunk and just kind of, you know, have a nice little holiday. Um, so to kind of recap where we've been over the past couple of months, and it has been a crazy busy period. So do a lot of Spark and Databricks, obviously. And on that side, the release of SQL Analytics, uh, the push forward of some of the kind of the new libraries they're putting in, the continued non-stop march of all the new runtimes and the functionality we're getting in there, it's there's a lot to keep up with. So there's a huge amount of stuff been happening, which is all about maturity and this heavy focus on make it good for SQL people, make it more accessible for people coming from traditional warehousing, traditional BI, data analytics, not just the kind of the deep big data engineering or the data science side. So it's balancing out that plateau. Now, we've got loads of exciting things that we're talking about coming up. Again, don't know when we're going to be seeing the next generation Git workspaces, but that's a super exciting stuff. There's lots of kind of hints of libraries and things. that I've got uh, a peek on. Loads and loads of really, really good stuff coming out. And again, assuming January, February, we'll have lots more stuff to talk about. There's also a huge backlog of requests I've had. So come January, February, we'll be talking about some deeper kind of troubleshooting. I've been doing lots of Ah, memory debugging of streaming jobs. So we'll be talking about that. We'll be having a look at what happens if you've got an autoloader style job and there's some funny business going on. How does autoloader work with trigger once and that whole mechanism? Loads and loads and loads of kind of depth of detail of Spark. So we'll keep those coming throughout January and February. On the other side of the fence, Synapse has obviously gone live. And at the same time as Synapse has gone live, we had Purview announced. Now, I did a quick little overview video of Purview, but there's so much more inside there. Um, with the GA of signups, we had things like CICD released, and it didn't really work for me when I first turned it on. So, a fresh, fresh pair of eyes in January, and we can take a look at that as a hopefully smoother story now that dust has settled, and we can look at how we actually use it as a real enterprise production tool, hopefully. I was going to do a quick, um, we're doing a little bit of a play to say, kind of, can I build out a warehouse in a, or lake house, or modern data warehouse, uh, in, in half an hour, in 45 minutes. So I'll do kind of a couple of little special videos of just literally start to finish. Can we get there quickly? Because that's the whole point of all these tools. We could always build a warehouse. We could always build something that kind of functions, but it was always hard and had workarounds and had a load of script and had a load of helpers and stuff. We're getting closer and closer to, it's actually fairly easy now with a few good ideas about how these things works and a few good architectural patterns. So we'll be having a look at some of that stuff. So loads, loads, loads more purview to come, loads of how well does it categorize a lake now? How to well can we push data to it using the API? Uh, can we get at the Atlas underlying stuff? Because certainly for me, one of the big, big things 
Databricks, I use Hive a lot. Hive is so important. And if you're using Apache Atlas, which is baked into a lot of the Azure purview stuff, you've got a thing called the Apache Hive uh, Atlas Bridge. Something like that. Uh, which essentially allows you, anytime you change your um, Hive records, anytime you add a table, add metadata, do anything, it'll then ping a message into a queue, into a Kafka queue, and that'll go and update your Atlas store. Can we do the same with Purview? Don't know. Gonna try. So there's loads of interesting stuff we'll be trying out over January, February, March. Uh, basically, tons and tons and tons of videos coming. Just, you know, not this week, not next week. Maybe the week after, we'll see. So... You guys have a happy holidays. Have a fantastic break. If you're having a break, please have a break. Uh, and otherwise, yeah, we'll catch you again in January. As always, don't forget to let us know down below if there's any topics, any new tools, any areas you wanted to go into, any... You know what? I've never been seen a video about how you solve this problem. Let me know down in the comments and we'll line up the videos when we get. Obviously, there's a bit of a backlog of stuff to talk through, but we'll get to it eventually. And yeah... If you haven't liked and subscribed, just, you know, just hit that button. It's always good for us. And otherwise, I will see you in the new year when it won't be 2020 anymore. And I cannot wait. So see you then. Cheers.